and welcome mindsetters to this session of Learn Extra Life. Welcome great tens to life science. I'm Ty and I'm here with Cheryl who's going to be taking us through today's lesson. What are we doing today? We're going to be doing a session on ecological biomes today. All right. All right. Okay, so on that note, Cheryl, while you make your way over across the board, I'm going to tell the mindsetters what they need to do. Mindsetters, you know the drill by now. You need to get on the page, get chatting to me, let me know what you guys are thinking. If you're lost in here, if you need help, Post, 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 and let me know if you guys are lost anywhere. If you, if you desperately have a question that you need to find out the answer for, just make sure you send it to us. Well, onto the Facebook page, then I can get that question to Cheryl, and Cheryl can help you out. But as I always say, if you don't post, I can't help you. So make sure you have your pens and pads out and you're ready to make notes, because we're gonna about to get ro on the road with the show. So Cheryl, take it away. Thank you, Ty. Good evening, grade 10s. Today we're going to start off with um, biomes, as you can see from the board. Last week you would have had a lesson on the beginning of ecology, where you looked at all the different biotic and abiotic, the living and the non-living components all right, that we find in our biosphere. Remember a biosphere? That is the part of the earth that uh, has that can sustain life. You're, you did the lithosphere, which was land, the hydrosphere, which was water, and you would have done the atmosphere, which would obviously have been the air. Now, when you looked at certain terms, one of the terms that you looked at was going to be ecosystems, right? And remember, ecosystems was the relationship that the abiotic factors, the non-living, the water, the gases, the air, the temperature, the wind, fire, um, physiographic factors, all of those are going to have an effect on what kind of life, living, a, um, biotic components are going to be living there. So when we look at a biome, all right, a biome is a really, really large ecosystem. Okay, It's a large ecosystem. If I were to give you a term for it, all right, a geographical term, it's a very large ecosystem in what we're going to see that has a common climate. Right? So the situations are the climate, the temperature, all of those are going to be quite similar. And in respect, right, the animals and the plants, the vegetation, right, that is all going to be um, quite specific for that particular region. So what we're looking at is a geographical area that has um, very um, characteristic climate conditions, which in turn right, are going to lead to characteristic living organisms that are going to be found there. Okay, so if we have to look, all right, you don't have to know these, right, but I just wanted to put them up on the board to show you that when we look at the world, all right, the world, the, the earth itself has divided also up into, into biomes. If you were doing... Um, Last week when you were doing abiotic factors, one of the things was latitude, all right? Where the equator, what do we know about the equator? Warmer, lots of rainfall, and as we get closer to the poles, what's going to happen? It's going to get colder, all right? Also, air moves. So even if we look on a large scale, what we're going to see is that the world itself, each, part of, each of our continents, all right, has, a, has its own biome. So we can split it up into really big ecosystems where it's universal across the latitudes over here. Or as we're going to look at today, we're going to look at South Africa specifically when we're going to look at South African biomes. Okay. When we look at the biomes, all right, you should all recognize the map of South Africa. All right, and then when you have a look here, if you have a look on the side, this is just a basic diagram. You will notice quite often that there tends to be a variety of diagrams, all right, and different areas that might just differ slightly when it comes to the biomes, but you mustn't worry. We're just going to concentrate on the major ones, and then we will mention, I won't say the less significant ones, but the ones that aren't as obvious, okay? So when we... When we talk about geography, I'm going to mention specifically, all right, the different, um, the different areas, provincial areas. So I'll make use of the Gauteng, the Limpopo province, because I think we're all much more comfortable and are able to picture in our mind, right, which areas they are. And those of you who come from the different areas, think about what your area is like. Have a look, see, you need, you obviously should be aware around you um, of 
When does it rain? When is it hot? When is it cold? What kind of animals do you see? Those kind of things. Okay? So it's also good to have a general knowledge and to have a good knowledge about your country. Some of you who take tourism, right, this will help you as well to have a better knowledge of South Africa. And those of you who love to travel, all right, awesome. You can plan your holidays here. You don't always have to go off somewhere else. Okay, the first one I'm going to concentrate on, as you'll see, I've highlighted each area, all right? The first one we're going to concentrate on is the savanna, the savanna biome, okay? If you were to look at it over here, you will see that is the majority of the Limpopo province, okay? Going into slightly here into the Northern Cape, this area over here, some of you might know as the Kalahari, all right? So over here, the savanna moving inwards around there into the Northern Cape. What you'll find here, though we call it savanna, South Africans right, tend to call it bushveld. When you think of South Africa, this is the picture that you generally seem to look at. You know, when you watch the hunting programs and all of that, it's these, all right, these scenes from the bushveld, all right, that you often are going to have a look at. Okay? When we look, as I said to you, remember, okay, the biotic and the abiotic factors are going to have a large effect on each other, more so the abiotic. And what you're going to find here, those of you, all right, who come from the province, we know that we have the winters tend to be somewhat cooler. Our summers there are very, very hot. Okay, so we're going to have more rainfall in the summers. It's also a bit of a dry heat because plants tend to, transp um, transpiration seems to um, decrease slightly. So we, sometimes you often hear people talk about in the northern province that it's, it's like a dry heat, not like um, down here where it seems to be far more humid. Okay, so when we look at, I want to just show you the pictures all right, that come to, this is what I want you to think of. When you think of the bush felt, what you're going to think of is the big five. All right, definitely. If I were, go, I'm going to go back to our map, all right, for those of you, what do we find here often? Game parks. Right, Limpopo is very well known for their game parks. Even into Mpumalanga, all right, the area as well, we're going to find the Kruger National Park going from the Mpumalanga upwards into the north, all right, and there you're going to find what we call the big five. Remember the lion, all right, the rhino, the elephant, the buffalo, okay, and the, the leopard, which now I think they're going to make the big six and they want to add the whale to it. Okay, so if we have a look here, all right, if we think of the Limpopo province, elephants are also very, very predominant in that area. And if you have a look, I want to just show you, for vegetation, this is a very common plant, all right, in the tree, in the, in the, um, the Limpopo province. Most of your notes, the upside down tree or the baobab tree. It's a very, um, it's a common feature in, these pr in, the, in the province. This tree over here, elephants love this tree over here, and some of you, I think, also like the fruit, and that is the marula tree. All right, the marula elephants also love to eat the, the marulas. I'm sure you've heard of amarula, all right, and they, they love to eat that over there, the elephants. So these are common trees, and if you think about we make marula juice and everything, part of our environment. If we go back, all right, to our map, sorry, if we go back to our map, what you will also notice, okay, is when we talk about the Limpopo province, this side over here does get quite a bit of rain, and that brings with it quite a few problems. Those of you, all right, if the who live there or those of you who might visit there, you need to be careful of malaria, all right? Malaria, quite common in, this, in, this, in the savannah region. Okay, we're also going to find the, our South Africa's deadliest snakes, unfortunately, stay here as well. All right, so you've got quite a, quite a, um, a large area filled with a variety, a large variety of our wildlife. And those game parks actually are very important for our country when it comes to tourism, all right, people coming to visit and, and hunting. Okay, let's have a look 
at our next one, we, when we look at the Nama Karu, we're looking at towards down here towards the Eastern Cape, upwards the Northern Cape, and a little bit of the Western Cape. The Nama Karu, the Western coast over here, this is going to be the succulent Karu, and up towards just on the edge over here, all right, of the Northern Cape, going into Namibia, are slight desert conditions. South Africa doesn't really have a desert, okay? Starting a little bit over here, but the desert is really much in the, the Namibia area. So when we look at the Nama Karoo, when we look at the succulent Karoo, what we are going to notice that they, very m they have a very similar climate, okay? They're going, to f they're going to have similar plant life, they're going to have similar vegetation, all right, even along over here. Now, if you will notice... Coming along down here, right past the Western Cape, down through over there, you have got the cold Benguela current. Now that cold Benguela current, right, brings in cool air. And that cool air usually is stable and it sinks. And it does not bring with it rain. What it can bring in is fog, but it doesn't bring in a lot of rain. So what we are going to find here is we're going to find an area where rainfall is going to become a limiting factor. All right? So less rain, you need to then start to realize that the plants and the animals are going to have to adapt right, to that lack of water. When we look at the Namakuru, all right, let me go here. Okay. Oh, there we go. Let me show the pictures. Okay. Some of you might not recognize the things. Okay, but I want to just show you over here. Okay, this is a stone plant. These are plants. Okay, so they're adapted. You'll notice it's not very, um, there's very little water there. These are actually stones, and they actually use um, camouflage. Right, or mimicry, they look like stones so that herbivores all right, do not eat them. You will see quite often all right, in the Nama Karoo and the succulent Karoo, because of the dryness, when something dies, plants or animals die, they don't decay because there's no water, so there's very little bacteria. So what happens is that plant dying, etc., is going to bring more food for the herbivores. So the lack of decay in these dry areas actually is food for the herbivores. So you'll see here this plant, right, to try and obviously survive, has come up with a different kind of mechanism, right, um, mimicry or camouflage. This acacia tree, all right, is also... You'll notice the trees, there are, there are going to be trees in the, in the Namakuru, but not very much of them. You'll see one of the words we're going to talk about, all right, is endemic. When we talk about an endemic species, we're talking about a species that's found only in this particular place, nowhere else in the world. And this little bird over here, it's a stock, right, it's totally endemic to this area. It's not going to be found anywhere else. The plants that you are going to find, all right, that are going to be there, you're going, it's the same as it's, we're going to find in the succulent karoo, okay? It's dry. So what are we going to find? We need plants that are either going to be able to store water, so your succulents, all right, or they're going to have ways in which their leaves are adapted so that they can lose less water. So they have cactuses which can store, they've got thorns. All right, some of them, like the well witchier plant, can absorb water through its, um, through its leaves, which is very rare. We know that water usually goes through the roots. So all of these plants, or some of them, all right, are in seed, and then when it rains, up they will bloom, and then when the drought comes, they will spend the rest of their, all right, the rest of their term, all right, underground, usually bulbs and tubers. All right, you will also find here there's very little rivers that are perennial. Perennial means all year through. So because you're going to have very little perennials, perennial um, rivers and that, you're going to find, again, there's a lack of water. So what's going to happen when the rain does come? All that sand is usually going to be washed away. 
right? Because there's nothing holding the sand down, so there's going to be a large amount of erosion. So if we have a look, as I said there, if we have a look at the Namakuru, right? Very, right, very, you'll see here the, the riverine rabbit. And one thing, all right, that the, in the center, in the Namakuru, is well known for its spring box, which, as you can remember, is our national emblem, all right, our buck. Right, but these days, unfortunately, in the Namakuru, there's a lot more farming with sheep and goats. Right? Commercial farming has taken over that area, so a lot of the biodiversity right, is becoming a lot scarcer. Okay, let's go on to the next one. All right. This is the grassland. Now, if you, if you have a look here, the grassland, all right, take lots of the high felt, as we call it, all right, because if we go down here, go down to the escarpment, down to, down to Durban, right, down to the coast. So we're looking at areas, Gauteng, right, Mpumalanga, some of KwaZulu-Natal, and also some of towards the, the, the northern Cape there. Now we'll find the grasslands. The grasslands, grass, all right, is a very, very hardy species. Grass has to be very hardy. The reason being, right, is because they have to survive winters that are very, very cold, all right, and summers that are very, very warm. Although they do have rainfall in the summer, what we usually find here is that our winters can get very, very cold. If you guys can remember, a couple of weeks ago, we even had snow. Okay, and sometimes during the winter we have frost. So if, um, grass has to be able to survive the hottest of hot temperatures and the very, very cold temperatures, and it does that very well. Okay, because remember, grass is, can um, reproduce asexually, vegetative reproduction. You guys all know if you plant a little patch of grass, all right, and then a couple of weeks, the whole area is then covered, even in the garden where you don't want it. But the area is then covered. When we look at the grassland, one of the things that happens is grass is very important for the soil. What grass does is grass starts to break up rock into soil particles. Okay, and, that so and, the, and the weeds, the roots of the rock, all right, what of, the, of the grass, they break down the soil, weathering, chemical weathering and, f and physical um, weathering. And what you find then is you actually start to break rock down into soil. Right? So if you're going to have a lot more soil, then you're going to have a soil type that's much more fertile, that is much more beneficial to all of the, the plant types that are growing there. If we have a look, all right, here, when we, we think of this, all right, again, we're thinking we, the most prolific grass is called r uh, the red grass, the roy grass, right, very hardy, okay, and here, these animals, the blessed book, the, the antelopes, they are more common in these areas. Um, long time ago, you'll see that most of these areas, all right, were teeming with animals, but what has happened now, late, uh, you can obviously think, if you look at the area, if we go back to the map, what do you notice? The area is very, very commercialized, urban areas. So urban areas are starting to take over, all right, from the natural vegetation. So the only thing you're probably likely to see roaming around is going to be a cow, all right, or the odd wild animal, the rabbits, etc. Okay, um, when we get to the grasslands, you will actually se see that um, the history has told us that this area over here has been farmed for millions of years, all right? And this farming, they f for livestock, so grass. They want to feed it. If they had a tree, they probably used to chop it down, all right? Because they're chopping down of the tree for fire, for, for, um, for wood, for fire, for warmth, rather than for, all right, for recreation or anything like that. Okay. All right, should, I think, I think, think we need to Before we break. step into the next thing, we yes, should take a little average. I think ad that's break. a good idea. All right, so on that note, mindsetters, I hope you don't disappear anywhere. Fine, go do what you have to do. Go to the bathroom, go get a snack, whatever. But make sure you come back right after this quick ad break. See you soon.
and welcome back, mindsetters. Hope you had a nice little break. You went to do whatever you had to do. You went to put your bags down. You went to change your uniform. Whatever you had to do, now you need to be paying attention. Put everything else away. Have your pens and pads out and ready to make notes. By the way, we actually got a question in, Cheryl, if you don't mind me asking. Pleasure wanted to find out how many biomes do we have in our country? Okay, Pleasure, sometimes, there's, as I said earlier, there's a bit of a... Um, some say they combine some of them together, but if you work on, it's easier to work on the eight major biomes. I'm going to, I'll quickly show you what they are. If you look at the map, all right, we have done savanna, we have done grassland, so that is two. Number three is going to be our Namakuru, we have done that, that is number three. What we're going to be doing now, all right, is the Fainbos, that is number four. What we're going to find up along Durban over here, we're going to find thickets, all right? That could be number five. You'll see a small area over here that is going to be um, the forests. That's going to be number six. We're going to have a look at succulent karoo, number seven, all right? And you will find... We do say deserts, that's number eight, but one of the, one of the ones that we also have are wetlands. Now, when, when we look at wetlands, like we're going to see them just now, you will see they, sp they, they spread out throughout the country. So it's not, just, um, it's not kept to just one particular area as the others usually are. So that becomes what we call an aquatic biome rather than the, all right, the eight major terrestrial ones. I hope that answers your question. All right, let's carry on with looking at our biomes. If you were to look at all the biomes, I think this, all right, is South Africa's most, pri the pride and glory of South Africa is our Fainbos area. Because this area, if you have a look where it is, right, it's in the Western Cape leading up to the Eastern Cape. And, the, and the, if we have a look over here, all right, let me just get there. If we have a look over here, let me just get the pencil going. I'm going to use another color. If we look at this region over here, all right, as most of us, we say that's the Cape, the Cape Town, that's going to be your area of your Fainbos, all right? So you're going to have mountain ranges over here, and I'm sure most of you are quite familiar with Table Mountain. So the Fainbos area, this area, Fainbos means little leaves, all right? This area has got the most endemic plant species that can be found in South Africa. It actually, all over the world, they have taken floral kingdoms, where six kingdoms, which are um, six areas that have got the most biodiversity, and the South African, um, the Cape Floral Kingdom is, is South Africa's pride and glory there. If we have a look, all right, at the, our areas that we're going to see, okay, it's going to be what we the Cape weathers. Now, the Cape Town weathers, all right, the weather that we often see in Cape Town, can be, you, c you know, it's lots of, lots of rain, all right, during the winter months, but the winter months also can be very, very windy and can be very, very cold, right? The current that's coming through there is still the cold Benguela, but at the bottom where it meets the, the warm Agalis, there is going to be some rain. Okay, so what we're going to have a look over here, when we have a look at the, the Fainbos, all right, this is the one that you guys are going to come to mind immediately. That's where one of the, the, um, the characteristics is going to be the protea, all right, which, as I said, where's the springbok is our national emblem for the buck. The, our king protea is our national flower emblem. All right, so if we have a look at our Fainbos, Right, you're going to see some of the area over there. This, uh, those of you who can recognize it, sorry, let me go back again. All right, that is rooibos tea. Okay, rooibos, the area in which rooibos is grown is totally what they call a bioclimate. All right, it's such, the area in which it's grown has got such particular climatic conditions that that's the only place that it can be grown. And you know that rooibos, other than teas, right, is also wonderful, all right, for skin care and all of those things. Lots of the plants that are found in the fainbos, okay, are very much, if you have a look at buku, right, all of that 
helps in medicines. The Feinbos has such a great biodiversity, lots of it is helped in, in the medicine sector. Now if we, we have a look here, what's very important about the Feinbos is that, as I said to you, most of the species are endemic. That means we don't find them anywhere else in the world, just here in this particular region. But if we go back to our map, all right, those of you who are from the, the Cape, what you will also notice along there, what do we like to call this area? The wine route. Okay, the wine route. So this area over here is very, it's highly industrialized. So wine farms, right, all along this area are taking over from land that should be used for, all right, for natural vegetation. Also, when we come here, we also find that the introduction of alien species into this area is also having an effect on the survival of these species. All right, some indigenous plants don't have any, um, some um, non-indigenous plants, sorry, don't have any effect on the environment. Um, we're not going to bring them, they're not going to, we don't need to kill them immediately, right? Rather let them die out so we not replace. The black wattle is one of those that generally needs to be cut down immediately because it absorbs and keeps so much water. And we find that that is also, all right, decreasing our biodiversity. Now, the funny thing about Feinbos, all right, is it needs fire. It needs to have fire in order for the seeds to actually to burst open and to germinate, right? The heat from the fire actually stimulates a chemical inside the seed, right, and that actually helps with germination. So where sometimes where fires are not very helpful, when it comes to the Feinbos, all right, it is a very helpful way of germinating. If I were to look at the animals again, all right, notice here this is a very, um, the shell of the tortoise. You'll see there it's called the geometric tortoise. You'll notice it has a very, all right, particular shape on its shell, which makes it quite noteworthy. As I've said, there's the rooibos. For those of you who love olives, Okay, in your salad or your olive oil, all right, also a good region there. The one animal that is, there's not a lot of large animals there, all right? Most of them are small little riverine rabbits, there's dussies and those kind of things. What you're going to find there, all right, is leopards. Leopards are, all right, one of the, the main species that are going to be found. Me leopards tend to be solitary creatures that like mountainous areas, all right, which is perfect all right, for that region over there. Okay, let's carry on to, you'll see over here, this is a little clip springer key, all right, small little, small little buck, all right, and obviously with the mountainous regions there in the Western Cape that we do have the mountains, the clip springer, which means literally rock jumper, all right, it's going to be adapted nicely, small, right, for that area, and very mobile among the rocks. Okay, let's have a look at the next one. Okay, this is now, as I say to you, the succulent karoo. Now, the succulent karoo is still is very similar, okay, to, all right, to the, um, over here, if we have a look, sorry, it's very, um, it's very similar to the, to the, na the Nama Karoo. Now, for those of you who, I'm going to just do it over here, sorry. Let's go this area. You can see it's highlighted, all right? This is far, much nearer to the coast, right, than the Nama Karoo is. So what you tend to find there is that there's a lot of fog, all right? Although there might not be a lot of rain, there's lots of fog. And what the fog does is when there are trees there, it actually makes lichen. Remember, lichen grows on trees. It's that, that greeny-white kind of mold. All right, I think I've got a picture here. I'll show it for you just now. And that actually adds as a food source, all right, for lots of the, the little the, um, insects and the birds, etc., that are living in that area. When we look at the, nama, at the, sorry, the succulent karoo, all right, there we go. Most of you, all right, when we think of it, our big tourist attraction there is going to be our Namaquiland daisies. 
What you will find usually, you will see they have a bit of a winter rainfall, all right? They have a bit of a winter rainfall, not too much rain. It's very dry. And that winter rainfall brings about the most awesome, beautiful carpet of daisies that brings a lot of tourists, all right, into, into the into that area, all right, the Western Cape route. And remember, they're only going to, all right, flower for a couple of weeks, and then they're going to die, and it's going to be all dry again. Other plants that are there, all right, are going to be your fahis. If we look at the animals that are there, all right, small, not overly large. Again, the area, as I said, remember, is very dry because of that cold Benguela current not bringing too much moisture into the coast. If you'll have a look here, the bat-eared fox. All right, I'm sure all of you can see the meerkats. We're going to have our little reptiles, our lizards, and our geckos. Right? And what we're going to find quite often is because it's generally very hot during the day and then much cooler at night, that lots of the animals here are going to be nocturnal. Right? Because it's much cooler at night, they're going to come out and they're going to, their behavior, whether it's to hunt or to find whatever they need to find, they're going to do that at night because it is much cooler. Okay, we're going to go on to the next one. All right. As you will notice over here, I think I definitely am going to need to highlight this one. Okay, it's a very, very, very small one. South Africa's climate, all right, and probably our farming techniques, etc., is not very conducive to large forests, okay? Those of you, if you think about this area over here, I think most of you will be looking at Nisner, the Nisner forests. Those of you who've read um, Dalian Matia's book, you know, um, Philosa Kint and all of those, they are all set here within the, the Nisner forest area over there. So if we have a look at the forest, there are a few, every now and there's a few little spatterings of forests up along here, but generally, all right, the amount of rainfall and the soil type does not encourage the growth of really large trees because that's exactly what forests are. They're really, really large trees. When we look at plants, right, forests, those large trees are what we call climax communities. Remember, you have pioneer communities like moss and fern and grass that start to break up the soil and add the nutrients so that eventually the much larger plants right, can then come and grow there. So when it comes to our forests, large trees, all right, quite humid, and you actually, funny enough, you'll actually find elephants, all right, in that. Now, because of the very fertile soil, you are going to find a large variety of trees. Over here, this is an epiphyte. This is an orchid, all right, that's growing on the trees. Here we can see our um, acacia, little daycare keys, the bird life in the forest, you're going to have a much greater biodiversity, all right, of birds. Because of the high amount of rainfall, you can have all the trees together. And I'm not talking about sappies plantation trees. That's not a forest. That's commercial farming. I'm talking about a natural bio, all right, that is there naturally, not man-made. You'll have a look here, the bush pig, right? One of my favorite birds, that is the lurie. So you're going to have the trees bring about a whole different right, variety, especially if we look here for the first time, we're going to see birds. We're not going to see birds too often in the desert, right? Because there's very little for them to eat. It's also very cold there, right? And generally, the coldness, they're going to stick to more milder temperatures. Okay, so the forest, large, big trees, lots of... Uh, um, bird life, and lots of small little animals. As I said, the bush pig, the daikiki, right? But funny enough, believe the elephants as well, okay, also are going to be found within this forest region. So when we look at forests, all right, you're going to see that generally they need to have rain all year round. Most of the biomes that we've looked at, it's seasonal rain. Okay, so for a forest, you are going to have to look at quite a high 
percentage of rain right throughout the year. And obviously, most of the soils, believe it or not, um, in the, the other regions you can understand in the deserts and those kind of in the in the the Namakuru and the succulent Karoo is not very fertile because there's not a lot of waste that's dying in there, all right? The soil, very fertile, very fertile, all right, can nice big trees can grow. Okay, Ty? Mm, I think after this we can go for a little ad break. I think so. All, all right. right. So mindsetters, you know the drill. Make sure you get on the page, chat to me, chat to me, and let me know what you guys are thinking. If you guys are having any problems, any issues, let me know. Post them on the page, and I'll get those credits to Cheryl. But for now, we'll see you after this break. And welcome back, Mindsetters. Hope you had a nice little break there and you went and did whatever you had to do because now you have to focus, pay attention, and make sure that you're writing notes. I'm loving what's happening on the page. Just want to send a quick shout out to Stephanie, Lucinda, Mfundo. I'm seeing all you guys on the page. I'm loving the interaction. Thank you so much, guys, for posting. But on that note, I'm going to hand over to Cheryl, who's going to take it away. Take it away, Cheryl. All right. We are almost finished. All right. But we're going to do the last couple of biomes. And then after that, we're just going to have a bit of a recap, just going over the main points once again so that you have got it clear in your mind. Okay, the next biome that we're going to look at is thicket. Now a thicket is not, we can't call it a baby forest, but it's not yet a forest. There's not enough rainfall to sustain really, really large trees. So we're going to have quite a biodiversity of smaller, and you'll see some of the pictures, far more attractive plants. Right, if we look at the area, okay, I'm going to use blue. It's going to be what you guys know as the coast, all right? The Natal North Coast and the South Coast. And you will notice, remember what I said, what's going to come down here is going to be that warm, all right, Benguela current. So if you've got the warm air coming in, what's going to happen is the air is going to rise, it's going to become unstable, and you're going to have condensation occurs, and you're going to have rain. So it's got much higher rainfall here, right, than we saw on our dry west coast over there. So remember, ocean currents is also a physiographic feature. Remember, physiographic, a place's position on the earth. Okay, also we're going to find it's at lower altitudes, so there is going to be more oxygen, and it is going to be far more humid. When we look at a thicket, a thicket is like dense bush. Those of you who have been to, been to the, the beach, you will notice sometimes that although there's nothing on the beach, if you just, there's little hills, right? And if you look at those hills, very often you will find that there's small little succulents that are growing in the sand, all right? And if we have to have a look at them, I want to show you here. Right? That should be a common feature. Small little shrubs, if you have a look at the plants, lovely, colorful, bright bushes, shrubs, okay? But we definitely don't have trees. So though we have quite a lot of vegetation, it's quite dense. Those of you who have been around, right, the, the, the areas, the, the coastal areas over there, the natural vegetation there is quite dense. You actually feel that you're almost in a forest, right? But the, 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 the areas that are sort of forestry are very, very limited because of that lack of rainfall. When we look at animals, right, that are predominant there in the thickets, you're going to see monkeys. Believe it or not, have a look over here. Monkeys, and those of you who've been to the coast should know that. I don't know if those of you, when you go on holiday, right, you need to keep your windows closed because scurrying around, all around, because there's usually bushes, thicket, behind all these holiday places, and that's a wonderful place, all right, for the for the monkeys to be there. We don't so much see the black rhino and the kudu. You are going to see smaller squirrels, um, hares, rabbits, those kind of things, because most of the, the um, larger animals are going to be on the game farms that are in those areas, because they obviously need to become protected. An interesting photo that I found here is you'll see, this is the African 
python, all right? And it's actually strangling a little daikaki there, all right? So pythons, although not poisonous, right, can strangle the living daylights out of you, and they are found there in all those, those thickets. When you see thickets, you think of thick bush, all right? And that's exactly what it is, nice, thick bush. Now, if we go on to our next, all right, you will see here that there is no place that we have highlighted on the map. Because when it comes to wetlands, well let me go back again, when it comes to the wetlands, all right, there is no specific biome. We cannot say it's found in this area, it's found in that area. It's found, little areas of it are found throughout all right, our country. You'll see some of them are found here. They're, they're areas of natural water. Those of you who stay near wetlands right, or listen to the news, okay, that is your waterlogged areas. And it can just, in the middle of a residential area, you can have a large like marsh or a pla pan where there's lots of bulrushes and there's flamingos, and, and that's actually a wetland. Right? And what we don't realize is the importance of the wetland. We at the moment are destroying our wetlands by building holiday homes, by building houses, okay? Wetlands are essential. They filter our natural water system. Now, like those filters that you have at home to make sure your water's nice and clean, they are nature's own water filters. They take the impurities, they, after droughts, after floods, they try to absorb the water, to control the water, to bring it down. They filter it, they take it through to the estuaries. Remember what an estuary is? An estuary is where a river right, will meet the ocean. Again, if you go onto, right, especially here, Right, along the coast over here, those of you who've been down to, all right, down to Natal, where the river, you'll see, don't you, I'm sure you guys have swam in it where it's nice and warm, right, and the rivers come into, into the, the sea over there. Those are very important, those little estuaries, because that's where fish usually breed, all right, and that's where the little fish are hatched, and then they make their way into the salt water. So although we don't have, it's not an aquatic uh, um, biome, all right, it does play a very, very important part in the maintaining, right, of our environment. So that would be the wetlands. The last one we're going to look at, and then we will recap. Let me just show you, sorry, pictures, all right, bulrushes. That should be a, a, a picture that is very all right, common for you. Again, all these. Now remember what we call plants that live near water. Those are your xerophytic, I mean your hydrophytic plants. Remember desert plants that had no water were xerophytic, zero water. These plants are hydrophytic, right? Water loss is not going to be a problem to them. Have a look at their nice big leaves, their pretty colors. This is my favorite flower, just by and by. This is an arum lily. If you go down the west coast, it's quite amazing. You will see on the banks of rivers what we like try to grow in our garden are growing wild, all right, along the river banks. It's beautiful. And with that, we are going to see a lot of aquatic life. You're going to see flamingos, you're going to see ducks, you're going to see geese. Look, you're going to see your frogs, your different kinds of frogs. And obviously, you're going to have a large variety of fish. Okay, remember that the water is also its own biome. Okay, the water, whether it's salt water or whether it's fresh water, there's lots of living things that live in there. And it all depends on how deep the water is, how warm the water is, how polluted the water is. Okay, let's have a look at our last slide. As I said to you, I've only put a dot over here because technically, if we were to, all right, if I, if I was, I'm going to put a red over there. It would be here, just the border over here, all right, between Namibia, all right, and part of the, the Northern Cape. That would, that would be, all right, the desert area. Okay, so it's not really a major biome of South Africa because it doesn't actually, f it's not actually in our country. It just 
it just comes a little bit over, but it doesn't have such a huge influence, all right, as all the other biomes do. So when you have a look, all right, at your, at your desert, sorry, let me go down there. Remember what I was saying to you, the well witchier plant? This is a well witchier plant, all right? And for those of you who are in grade 11, you will actually realize it's, one of, it's actually in the pine cone, all right? The, the pine producing family. Doesn't look like it, but the in there. It's a, it, this is one of the most amazing plants because it can survive, all right? totally dry conditions. It absorbs water through its leaves and then it stores it in its roots. So you'll find this is a common, all right, desert plant. Also, you will see, all right, the leaves here. Very often, the plants that are in the desert, okay, they ha their leaves are poisonous or they sour because they don't want the herbivores, all right, to eat too much of it. So you'll see over there, okay, you can have trees, Right, you can have certain trees in the desert, okay, but not very seldom. The, here's the lichen that I was talking to you about. Okay, remember, lichen over here is a relationship between algae and fungi. It's a symbiotic relationship. All right, mutualism. The algae's got the chlorophyll that gives food, and the fungi's got the roots that attach over here. And this is what some animals are going to eat. All right, or if they blow away. It's, it's food, all right? It's algae, it's, it's, it's plants. What you will also see, all right, sorry. What you will also see, okay, is algae is a pollution indicator. The more algae, I mean, lichen, the more lichen, the less pollution, all right? The, the more pollution, the less. Have a look here, bats, all right? Somewhat nocturnal, all right? Our little rodents in the desert, and birds, all right? Small birds are going to feed. You're not going to find really large herbivores, right? You can find elephants. Elephants um, tend to be quite prolific in the desert. They can actually keep themselves cool, but they do tend to, are going to look for the much lusher, all right, thickets, etc. So when it comes to deserts, you're going to find your lots of reptiles are going to be there because they are ectothermic, all right? They are cold-blooded. The change in temperature is not going to be as noticeable for them, so they don't have to change their, their habits as much as other trees are going to do. Okay, so let's just quickly look at the map and let me go right back to the beginning. All right, right back. Let's see if we can remember... All right, all of our maps, okay. Oh, let's put this, let's get to be almost there. There we go. All right. So if we were to look again at our map, what are our major biomes? At the top over here, look here, Northwest Province, Limpopo, Pumalonga, even coming down into KwaZulu-Natal, we are going to have the savanna. All right, remember that's the bush felt. Here in the center are grasslands. Okay, running down our coast, we're going to have our thickets. All right, even going into there, there over here, we're going to find our forests and then our drier areas. This is the Namakuru, okay, leading on to the succulent Karoo, and then as you'll notice, as I said, look here, doesn't play such a part, it's even a little bit of a strip of desert, sometimes we're causing that, all right? And uh, the last area is our most prolific one, which is the Fane Boss. Okay, Ty, I think that is it for today. All right, so on that note, Mindsetters, just want to say thank you again for posting on the page. Thank you for interacting with us. Make sure, make sure you tell a friend to tell a friend to tell another friend. So we make sure we keep getting those numbers on the page going up, 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 and up. But on that note, Mindsetters, make sure you keep chatting to each other. And if you see a Mindset in trouble, as I always say, make sure you help them out. Do not just leave a Mindset stranded because that's not what we do here. The forum is for you guys to share and to share your ideas. But on that note, this is where I then sign off and say thank you for joining us. It's always a pleasure and we will see you next time. Cheers.